Welcome back to a new video. This one's going to be about reinventing the ZVS driver and hopefully building a powerful induction heater. In case this is a new topic to you, the basics is that there's an LC circuit that's DC coupled to the positive supply and one side at a time gets connected to ground. The MOSFETs are controlled themselves by the oscillation in the LC circuit. For this reason, this is a very simple circuit that's capable of self-oscillating and the frequency depends on the capacitance and the inductance, although it's usually around 50 kHz for this kind of a build. Okay, so now that we're all on the same page, let's take a look at what I'm actually trying to do. Basically, there's two things about this circuit that I don't really like and that this video is going to try to overcome. The first thing is that the gates of the MOSFETs, which are pretty delicate in general, are connected to a high voltage AC source, which I don't really like conceptually. I know that in theory we have the Zener diodes and the resistors and all that stuff which should protect the gates of the MOSFETs, which usually is the case, but the fact is that the approach isn't exactly beautiful. If we were building any kind of commercial product that sells for more than 50 cents and delivers more than one watt of power, this would be pretty much unacceptable. So what I want to do is design a circuit that uses a proper MOSFET driver. The second thing I don't like about this circuit is that the turning on and off of the gate is relatively slow. I mean it's dependent on the frequency and the slope of the voltage on the AC oscillation of the LC circuit and this isn't exactly fast for MOSFET switching standards. So by using the proper MOSFET driver I'm actually also solving the second problem which is quick and efficient MOSFET switching. And so at this point you'll probably be thinking uh, okay dude just put a MOSFET driver in front of the MOSFET gate and put the input where you would put the gate and it would all be fine, right? Why do you have to make a video about this? Well, actually, not so fast. The problem is that if the MOSFET starts switching a lot faster than it would with the regular circuit, this causes some noise on the LC circuit. This noise then goes back around in the loop and falsely triggers the MOSFET driver and basically what you have is a mess of things that are switching uncontrollably. So what we basically need is a circuit that listens to two logic states and as soon as there's a change it switches like it should with no delay whatsoever if possible and then as soon as it's switched it has to completely go to sleep basically not care about what happens and then after a little bit of time which is maybe one quarter of the period of oscillation of the LC circuit something like that it turns back on or wakes up and repeats this over and over now this also might seem like it's not too difficult to pull off I mean I guess you could just use a flip-flop and then wire the inputs around but the problem of making it not listen to the input for a short amount of time but then switch immediately without any delay when it's listening is actually quite difficult in fact I challenge you to come up with a simple circuit using logic gates or I don't know flip-flops you know basic digital ICs without using a thousand of them obviously and making this work at a certain point I kind of thought I had a solution but I was so tired of coming up with ideas that didn't work that I just decided to settle on using a microcontroller alright let's take a look at the conceptual circuit before I actually show you the complete schematic we have our LC circuit obviously and then both sides of this are connected to the inputs of an LM339 I believe which is a pretty basic comparator this comparator has two tasks essentially the first one is to be a little bit more flexible and resistant to a little bit of over voltage because we're still going to have to take the sample of the oscillating sine wave and then clip it using some diodes and resistors like we would do with the original circuit but it also has to provide a clean output for the microcontroller's digital I.O. to understand. Next we have our microcontroller and all this does is listen to the digital inputs and then switch the state of the outputs immediately or as quickly as possible and then go to sleep for a moment and not do anything, not listen to anything and then after that it keeps on and waits for the next state change on the inputs and change the outputs. The outputs of this microcontroller go to the inputs of the MOSFET drivers and this has the simple task of just switching the MOSFETs very quickly 
to achieve greater efficiency. All right, so here's the complete schematic, and I'm not gonna bother explaining everything. There's just a few things I'll point out. The first is you can see there's a lot of resistors in parallel here, and this is because there was too much power being dissipated, so I was having resistors burning on me. Then you can also see there's a capacitor or two in parallel, and this is because there's always some capacitance everywhere, and unfortunately there was a sort of an RC low pass filter effect happening, and this was enough to create a little bit of phase shift, so a delay, which is really not acceptable when we're trying to detect the zero crossing. So this capacitor solved that problem, luckily. Then you can see there's multiple regulators to achieve the correct supplies for the different ICs. And lastly, you can see that I'm using a positive reference to detect zero crossing. And this is done because since there's always a little bit of delay in everything, if I try to detect the crossing before it actually happens, this essentially saves time. So it's a little bit of a way of looking into the future and uh, reducing our delay. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the PCB. And uh, this time I'm designing it in KiCad. I've switched over from Altium just because why not? Here you can see the basic layout. We have the two MOSFETs and this is the bridge rectifier here which will be set down flat. Here we have the capacitor bank, the two inductors here. Here on the left you can see the low voltage digital stuff for controlling the whole thing. And in the 3D view you can see a little bit better how it's gonna look. We have on the lower side a huge capacitor that we will use on the output of the rectifier. The only thing missing in the 3D view is the heat sink on the left here and my hope is that it will be balanced so that we have the coil on the right uh, balancing out the weight of the heat sink on the left so that we can just set the whole thing on the capacitor's flat face on the bottom and it will just stand up by itself. I guess we'll see if that actually turns out to work. So now it's time to order the PCB. I'm going to be ordering it from PCBWay.com not just because they're the kind sponsors of this video, but because they've been extremely reliable in the past with all their PCBs that I've ordered. Here I'm just going to enter the dimensions of my board, how many layers I want, which is just going to be two, and then I think I'll choose the black solder mask just to make it look a little bit different. And another important thing I'm going to choose is to have a double thickness for the copper layers because I'm going to have some good currents going through them and I don't want them overheating. And after that I just upload the Gerbro files. Another great thing of PCBWay is their customer service. For example, you can see here I made a little mistake when I was designing the PCB because I used a footprint with a hole, but then I actually put another cutout around the footprint. So I was basically asking to make a hole inside of another hole. So as you see here, I got an engineer question, which kindly asked if I'd rather have the two holes for the MOSFETs or just keep the cutout, and I said I'd like to have the cutout. After that's cleared up, they start the manufacturing process, and as you can see here, you can keep track of it every step of the way. No more than one week after I made the order, I got the PCB at my doorstep, and let's take a look at it. As you can see, all the details look really nice, everything in order, even these customized pads for soldering the MOSFETs pins without bending them, and for soldering on the big coil, came out just perfect. So a huge thanks to PCBWay.com for sponsoring this video, and go check them out to order your own high quality PCBs for your projects. Alright, so first thing we do with our PCB is solder all the components, starting with the SMD ones. I'm going to apply some solder paste to all the pads, and then one by one I'll add the resistors and the capacitors and the few SMD ICs. Just like last time, I kind of made a mess here, and I'm not sure if it's because I'm using a hot plate that isn't even made for doing this job, or what the deal is, but whatever. I'll clean this up later with a soldering iron without any problems. On camera, it looks like a real mess, but actually it's because I was using a bunch of flux when I was fixing the stuff up with the soldering iron, and I actually can't find any chemical to clean off the flux effectively, but whatever. Next thing we do is soldering all the through-hole components. This is pretty simple and the result is what you'd expect. If you ever build a project like this, remember that the back of the MOSFETs are electrically connected to the drain pins and the two MOSFET drains cannot touch electrically. So you have to use uh, some kind of isolating pad that keeps them separate if you're using the same heatsink like in my case. Otherwise, a lot of people just use two smaller heatsinks. 
Then I screw in the huge capacitor, which by the way is not necessary. I just had it laying around, so I decided to use it. But you can definitely make this work with smaller capacitors, so don't worry about that. And here you can see the final result. I think it's looking pretty nice. And I was also pretty lucky because the thing balances perfectly on the capacitor. So it's very nice because it stands up by itself. Well, at this point, it's time to turn it on, check it out and see if it's working. Initially, I built this thing on a breadboard, as you can see here. And I had this issue where if I was using a high input voltage of like 40 volts, more or less, the big capacitors were actually swelling up and then kind of bursting which is definitely not okay and so i noticed that all the smaller capacitors for the resonant circuit work just fine while the big ones have this tendency of overheating if we drive them with a too high of a voltage so for this reason i was left with just small capacitors and the resulting frequency using those was about 60 kilohertz my impression using this is that with 60 kHz instead of 50 of when I was using it on the breadboard, the thing doesn't work as well. It seems like it takes longer to heat things up. I added a few small capacitors, which made a small difference. And then I had this really big 1.5 microfarad capacitor that I decided to add even though I can expect it's going to burst pretty quickly. And you can see that the frequency went down to 40 kHz and that showed a definite improvement. The only thing is that it lasted very little and the thing started swelling up. So I immediately removed it and the resulting frequency is like 56 kilohertz, something like that. And I would really like to bring it lower because I, I really think that it works better. There's multiple reasons for this. One is that in general, it's tied to the skin effect. In case you're not familiar with the skin effect, it's basically just a phenomenon that makes all the current flow or almost all the current flow on the outside layer of the conductor. And this basically just increases the resistance of our wire just because there's a less cross section through which the current actually can flow. For example, at 60 kilohertz, the skin depth is about 260 microns while at 20 kilohertz, the skin depth is almost half a millimeter. Now this has different consequences. The first is that since we have a effectively thicker conductor on the object that we're trying to heat up, uh, more current can flow and so it heats up better. The other thing is that our conductor for the big copper loop is also going to conduct better. And this means that it has a higher Q factor and more current can flow and so it just works better and it heats up less too. So overall, it's more efficient. Another advantage of lower frequencies, which are usually tied to better efficiency in converters, is that the slope at the zero crossing is shallower. And this means that if we detect the zero crossing at, say, 6 volts in our case, because I was using that divider as reference, we have more time or our circuit has more time to react and switch. And so if we have problems of switching a little bit late, this gives us more time and so the switching occurs closer to the zero crossing. In fact, here you can see that with the 40 kilohertz, at the zero crossing we basically have no disturbance, while instead at the higher frequency we we're having a little bit of a ripple here because it was switching a little bit late because it didn't have enough time to react. Also, we should probably see better efficiency because just switching fewer times per second means that it has fewer opportunities to waste energy. Ideally, I'd like it to resonate at around 25 kilohertz, and this is going to be a little bit difficult because it needs to have to make a pretty big capacitor bank made up of a bunch of small capacitors, which I don't have many at the time, but it's definitely an idea. A dumb mistake that I made when designing the PCB was to leave the holes for the MOSFETs and the full bridge rectifier just given by the default uh, footprints. And uh, this is because then the holes actually have a conductive surface on the bottom of the PCB and this gets pressed against the top of the heat sink. So when I was testing it, I didn't tighten the screws much, so it wasn't touching. And then when I went to tighten the screws, it touched and shorted something. I'm not sure what, but it left a huge burn mark and kind of scared me. So here you can see a few pictures of the effect of this. So my solution was to tape it up just to provide a little bit of insulation. Or ideally, when designing the PCB, I should make my custom footprints with no holes. Probing around a little bit, looking at the different waveforms in the circuit, we can see at the top always the one side of the oscillation of the LC circuit. 
And on the bottom we can see the point after the oscillation gets clipped for the comparator. Then here we can see on the bottom the output of the comparator, so 0 to 5 volts. Then here we can see after the microcontroller's output, so still 0 to 5 volts. And then finally here we can see the actual gate of the MOSFET switching on and off. And this gives you a little bit of an idea of what's going on, hopefully. Okay, so just as a final note, I guess I'm not going to upload the project files, the PCB files, just because it's a very customized design. And one would just have to have all the same components, which I think is pretty unlikely. Especially the huge capacitor, I don't think that's a common thing to have laying around. But feel free to use the schematic, the idea, everything you want. And if you have any questions or comments or doubts, just leave in the comment section. And thanks for watching till the end, and I'll see you in the next video.